Good morning, church. It is good to be back with you. Um, If you are like me and didn't quite get all of the raking done, the uh, leaves and pine needles will be there in the spring waiting for us. So we'll see. Maybe this snow will melt, but probably not this week. (laughs) Well, we're continuing our journey here through the book of Acts, and we are on Acts chapter 3. We're actually going to cover the whole chapter today. Uh, Pastor Elbin read the first 16 verses, and we're going to get to the rest of the chapter a little later on in my message. But Luke records for us this very memorable story, this historical event that happened in the life of the early church, and uh, it's one that's kind of hard to forget. It's such an amazing story to read about, this miracle, a lame man leaps. Text says jumps, but our kids always listen to this kid's tape, and he was walking and leaping and praising God, and so that's always in my mind, um, them in the back of the minivan swaying and singing that together, uh, one of those great memories. But this story begins with Peter and John doing something very natural for disciples to go and pray. And they're headed to the temple at the time of prayer. And they get to the entrance and they encounter this man who is begging for money. And that probably isn't typical here at our church as you come into the building. There aren't normally people there asking for help. But it was probably a little more common here. This setting maybe wasn't real surprising. Uh, The man who is here had been lame from birth. So the reason that he needed help was that he was unable to work. But rather than giving the man money, Peter does something rather unexpected, kind of different, something that didn't happen every day at the temple. He looks at the guy and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Then he reaches down and he helps the man get on his feet. And as I picture this man sitting there, I'm imagining that he's there and probably reaching out his hand, expecting as Peter got close that Peter was going to put some money in there. And to his surprise, Peter grabs his hand and pulls him up. And I don't think that the man was quite expecting that to happen that day. Now, we're not sure quite why Peter decided to heal this particular beggar on this particular day. And we're not sure how Peter knew that God was going to heal this man. Somehow Peter knew that this was the thing to do, that this was what God was about, and he was so in step with God and his spirit that he went ahead and, in Jesus' name, he healed this man. Scripture tells us that instantly the man's feet and angles became strong. There was no problem with muscle atrophy. There was no need to kind of learn his balance here. Verse 3, 8 says, He went with them into the temple, walking, jumping, and praising God. Can you picture this? Happening in the temple or happening in the church today? This man had never walked ever in his life before. Verse 2 says he was lame from birth. And if we sneak peek ahead into Acts chapter 4, we'll find in Acts 4.22 that it tells us that this lame man who was healed was in his 40s. In other words, for over 40 years, he had needed someone his entire life to carry him around and help him get places. But now, he's walking and jumping and praising God. Can you picture that happening in our church this morning? Someone in their middle 40s or 50s jumping around in the church, praising God, praise God. Maybe if you grew up in the Assemblies of God church like I did, that would make a little more sense. We had quite a bit of that going on. But in Judaism, in the temple, that wasn't really the common practice in the first century uh, Judaism uh, practice of religion. And so it's no surprise that we read toward the end here that the people at the temple, they're filled with wonder and amazement This was an incredible thing. This was not an everyday occurrence. This was not the the standard uh, modus operandi. You see, they knew this guy. They had known him for a long time. But they had not known him as a walker or a jumper. (laughs) They'd seen him sitting there begging. 
But now the reality of his mobility was shocking to them. Why did Luke record this story? I mean, besides the fact that it's very interesting and very memorable, what is the purpose of this miracle? Before we look at that question, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you are a God who is powerful and that in the name of Jesus there is great power and that there's nothing you can't do. Lord, as we now enter into this text and try to understand it, we pray by your Holy Spirit that you might enlighten this text. Not only the miracle here, but the the purpose of it, the the thing we're supposed to learn and, and come away with. We ask your help now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if your Bible's not already open or if you closed it, I encourage you to open it up again to Acts 3, verse 12. This event of this miraculous healing attracted quite a crowd, as you can imagine. People quickly gathered. They were curious what was going on, what all the ruckus was about. Verse 12, when Peter sees this crowd, he says to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? In other words, right off the bat, the first thing that Peter and John want this crowd that is gathered to understand is that this miracle, the purpose of it, was not about them. It wasn't because they were so great and so godly. That is not the purpose. But this miracle does have a particular targeted purpose. The purpose was that Peter wanted to point people to Jesus. And we'll see him do that. The the miracle will immediately point to Jesus. Verse 316, Peter clarifies it, says it very directly. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. You are eyewitnesses. You've been seeing this guy for years. You saw what happened today. And I'm telling you, it's because of Jesus. The power for this miraculous healing came in the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name that is the authority of his person. That's the source. And actually, we're going to learn more about the name of Jesus. We're going to see this show up quite a bit. Next week, we're going to get into Acts chapter 4, and there'll be specific reference to the name of Jesus six more times. In fact, before we get to the very end of the book of Acts, we'll continue to see the name of Jesus brought up. The name, over 30 times it's referred to. Because there's power there because of the person of Jesus and the authority of who Jesus was and who he is. Now, I want to offer a word of caution here. We should never think that this phrase in the name of Jesus is kind of like an abracadabra, that anyone at any time can just pray in Jesus' name and it's some sort of a prescriptive guarantee that God will do a particular thing. It's not like a magical incantation. Now, let there be no doubt, there is great power in Jesus' name. That's really the point that Peter's making. But that power is not subject to human whims. It is not subject to our personal agenda. That's why Jesus, during his earthly ministry, was very clear. When you pray, pray, thy will be done. So the point of this miracle was to point people to Jesus, but the fact is Peter's purpose was focused on a very particular group of people on this day at the temple. There's a reason the healing happened at the temple where these Jews were. In verse 12, Peter calls them his fellow Israelites. Again in verse 17, fellow Israelites. These were people he was connected to relationally. 
And similar to the message, you may remember a few weeks ago when we were in Acts chapter 2, Peter has a very similar message in many ways. A similar audience to Jewish people and a similar direct word that he wants to share with them. In Acts 3.13, Peter declares, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. In other words, Pilate was going to let Jesus go. Some of us can remember those words from the gospel where Pilate says, I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate wanted to release him. The Jews that were gathered in Jerusalem that day said, no, no, no. He needs to be executed. Peter goes on in verses 14 and 15, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. That's referring to Barabbas who was released that day. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. So here in verse 13, and then again in verse 14, Peter uses this word disown. Disown is to deny. In fact, some of your translations probably say deny. Turn our back on. Refuse to acknowledge a relational connection that we have. So Peter tells them, again, pretty directly, right to their face. You disowned Jesus. You killed him, the author of life. And what Peter's getting at, once again, just like he was back in Acts chapter 2, once again, he's making it clear that the Jews here who he was addressing in this crowd were some of the same Jews who had just a few months earlier been shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Peter knew this. This was a targeted audience that he was trying to reach. And the thing that we need to remember here is that Peter himself had a very keen understanding of what it meant to deny Christ. Peter understood not only what it was like to be a fellow Jew, but also to be an Israelite who had denied Jesus. In fact, when Jesus was being beaten, when he was being mocked, when he was being spit on, Peter had been right there in the courtyard. He was standing there listening and watching to all that was going on. Three times in a row, he had an opportunity to confess his faith in Christ, that he was a fully devoted follower of Jesus, but he didn't. Three times he denied him, and then the rooster crowed. So I'm sure that Peter's own denial, his own disowning of Jesus was on his heart and was on his mind and it it built an empathy within him as he delivered this message to his fellow Jews. He was their fellow Israelite and he understood, he was familiar with what it meant to deny Christ. And so now let's pick up our scripture reading where Pastor Elbin left off in verse 16. Let's pick up together at verse 17. So Peter goes on with his message. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. And here Peter lays it out as clearly as he's ever laid it out before. Peter tells them flat out, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the anointed one. Then he goes on in verse 21. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. And here, Peter's referring to Jesus, 
who was a Jew, who was from among the Jewish people. Peter says, you need to listen to what Jesus has been saying. Verse 23, anyone who does not listen to him, who does not listen to Jesus, will be completely cut off from their own people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And when God raised up his servant, referring here to Jesus, the Messiah, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning you from your wicked ways. So Peter's pretty direct with them here about what they had done to Jesus and that they were living wicked lives that they needed to repent. He just told them the way it was. And he delivers this startling truth to his fellow Jews who had disowned their long-awaited Messiah. Blessing comes to those who turn to Messiah Jesus. Peter concludes his message there with verse 26. When God raised up his servant, Jesus the Messiah, he sent him first to you, the Jews, sent him to you first to bless you, not to judge you, not to destroy you, to bless you by turning each of you away from your wicked ways. So the Heavenly Father sent Jesus first to the Jews. Eventually in the book of Acts, as we go along, what we're going to find is that the gospel will go out to the Gentiles and the whole world to the ends of the earth, but it starts with the Jews. They were meant to be the epicenter here in Jerusalem, In this next phase of God's redemptive plan, it started there. And once again, we think back to Acts 1.8, which again is kind of an outline for the whole book of Acts. Jesus said in Acts 1.8 that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But it's going to begin, it's going to start in Jerusalem. And specifically here, we're learning in the first few chapters of Acts, it's going to start with the Jews, with the Israelites. Here's the thing, though. Even though Jesus was sent to them first, turning to Jesus as their Messiah was precisely the problem. That was exactly the thing that was tripping them up in their faith. Notice how Peter refers to Jesus as God's servant in verse 26. When God raised up his servant, he did the same thing back in verse 13. And then notice how Peter brings up the suffering of the Messiah. Back in Acts 3.18, Peter explains, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. In other words, Peter here, in this whole sermon, in this whole message, he's developing this idea, he's trying to make it clear to them that Jesus is the suffering servant that was predicted way back in Isaiah 52 and 53. Jesus was this suffering servant. But this idea of a suffering Messiah didn't add up for the Jewish people. A suffering Messiah who came as a servant felt strangely foreign to these Jews. That didn't sound right to them. Even though he was clearly predicted that way and portrayed that way in their own Old Testament scriptures, they hadn't picked up on it yet. See, they had been raised in this religion of Judaism. And Judaism had a pretty limited, narrow view of the Messiah. They expected a conquering king. They expected the Messiah to come and kind of lay the smack down. That was their anticipation. Peter was trying to explain to them this distinction between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. In fact, that's what he's driving at in Acts 3, 20 and 21. It's a little confusing until you break it down, but Peter says that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him 
until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. In other words, Jesus' ascension up into heaven back in Acts chapter 1 began this interim period between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. His second coming, that's when he will come and restore everything. That's when the conquering king will be known by all. But his current role is in heaven. And that proves not only that he is alive and that he is well and that he is powerful, but it also proves that he is indeed the promised Messiah that the Jews had been waiting for. He just didn't come in the way that they had expected, or maybe I would even say preferred. One author puts it this way, heaven holds Jesus at God's side until the day when he returns. So Peter was giving these Jews an answer to a very important question, a a question that was going on in the mind of every Jew. Where is our Messiah? Why hasn't he come yet? What is he waiting for? Where is our Messiah? And Peter knew that they needed to understand where he was, so Peter tells them where Messiah is. Jesus is currently in heaven. He's ruling alongside the Heavenly Father. He's awaiting for the timing of his return, his second coming. (coughs) And what we find here in Acts 3 is really a distinction between a a Gentile way of thinking about Jesus and and a Jewish way of thinking about Jesus. Because I know as a Gentile, and I know enough of you who are Gentiles, that when we get to Acts 3, verse 19, we get excited about our sins being wiped out. We are drawn and attracted to times of refreshing from the Lord, like, oh, it sounds wonderful. But most of these Jews, on the other hand, they're attracted to something different. They're attracted to verses 20 and 21, where it talks about God sending the Messiah to restore everything as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. You see, as a people, they had been waiting so long. That's what was of greatest focus to them. That was the most interesting thing about what Peter was talking about. And what we see here is that there's an apologetic hurdle that the Jews are trying to jump over, and Peter's trying to help them get past this blockage this theological barrier to putting their faith in Jesus. Because if Peter ever wanted to convince them that Jesus was indeed their Messiah, he first needed to help them wrestle through why it looked different than they had expected it to look. Why Messiah hadn't returned as a conquering king. And frankly, why their own religious leaders hadn't accepted Jesus as Messiah. And we're actually going to get into all that next week when we get into Acts chapter 4 because we're going to see Peter face head-on with the Sanhedrin. And it's a fascinating chapter. We're excited to get there next week. But missing the Messiah would prove to be a, a vital mistake for the Jews, at least for many of them. Missing the Messiah included missing Moses' warning way back in the Old Testament. Peter reminds them in Acts 3, 22 and 23, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Again here referring to Jesus. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So Peter's basically telling them, failing To listen to Jesus means you're failing to listen to Moses. And the Jews knew their Old Testament. Moses was one of the heroes. The Jews knew the stories of what happened to Jewish people and Israelite people when they failed to listen to Moses. It never went well. (laughs) And he's saying, you guys, you're going to repeat the same mistake. By failing to listen to Jesus, you're failing to listen to Moses. Jesus is a prophet like Moses, only much greater. Who could possibly be so great that to not listen to him would mean that you'd be cut off from your own people? Well, the Messiah, 
That's who would be that great. And Peter's pressing them to make a decision about Jesus. Either accept that he's the Messiah or face the fact that you're going to be cut off from your own people. You're going to be cut off from God's people. And as a people group, the Jews were very much communal. Not being part of the community would definitely get their attention. That would raise their hackles a little bit and raise their concern to be cut off from their community. Back in verse 17, Peter said, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. When we first read that, it almost feels like Peter's being a little rude. But he's not here trying to say that they were stupid or unintelligent. He's trying to tell them that they were uninformed, or perhaps we should say they were wrongly informed. Previously, they did not know that Jesus was the true Messiah. In fact, their own spiritual leaders had rejected him. But we remember the words of Jesus back in Luke 23. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. See, there was a time in history where they were ignorant of what was going on with Jesus, but Peter is now correcting that ignorance, and he's showing them that the Old Testament scriptures had predicted this Messiah who would suffer. He's helping them see this. And the whole point of healing this lame man, remember the lame man? The whole point of healing him was to point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus, help them see what they needed to see. Help them turn to their promised Messiah. In other words, their prior ignorance did not take away their current need to repent. So Peter urges them in Acts 3, 19 and 20, Repent then, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Jesus is for you. That's what he wanted his fellow Israelites to understand. He so deeply cared for them. His his passion, his burden, his heart was broken that they couldn't see the thing that he hadn't seen at first either. He had to come to figure it out himself as well. But he so badly wanted them to come to this understanding, to come into this relationship. He's urging his fellow Jews, turn to God. Enjoy this trifecta of blessings, these three things, this forgiveness, this refreshing, and especially for his fellow Israelites, receiving their long-awaited Messiah. Don't wait any longer. Don't look any further. I'm telling you we found him. I'm telling you he's come. And I'm telling you he will come again. So receive him. And I suppose that's a very good message for you to hear if you're Jewish. And as we wrap up, it's important for us to note that we Gentiles have been granted access to these same three blessings. We need to pay attention to what God said back in Genesis 22. He said it to Abraham. Peter actually quotes it in Acts 3.25. Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And that offspring there is Jesus. Through Jesus, all peoples on earth will be blessed. All languages, all people groups, all ethnicities will be blessed through Jesus. So in other words, even though you and I weren't part of Peter's original audience, he wasn't really preaching to us as Gentiles at all. And yet... As we read from God's holy word today, as we record, as we see what Luke recorded in this message, we become an extension of Peter's audience. And we find that there is really much here that we need to know, and there's blessing here for us to enjoy and experience. 
both Jews and Gentiles, should be humbled by the reality of what we're reading in Acts 3. John Piper says it this way, we should both be deeply aware that we depend entirely on mercy, not on ourselves, not on our tradition, not on our ethnic connections. This should humble us and strip us of any arrogance or boasting in any presumed ethnic superiority. We Gentiles must humble ourselves to be saved through a Jewish Messiah and a Jewish covenant. And Jews must humble themselves to receive us unclean Gentiles into full covenant membership and share all the blessings of the promise of Abraham with the Gentiles. Another author puts it this way. Salvation is not by human right or by ethnic origin. Salvation comes through response to the promise of God. Salvation comes by response to the promise of God. The whole point is that God is the one who has mercy. Ethnicity is not de decisive here. We are all sinners. And the gospel is the power of God for everyone who believes. The power for everyone. So whether we are Jews or Gentiles, we need to believe. And then, only once we believe can we receive the blessings that come in Jesus name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather here in the church and via live stream. We thank you for your word and the way it blesses us, helps us to learn of the blessings that are available to us through Jesus. Thank you that these blessings are available to all peoples. Lord, may that humble us. May that teach us to have that level of understanding, that attitude. Lord, give us the humility we need to remain deeply grateful for the many blessings of salvation. May we continually turn to you day by day, turn to you for forgiveness, turn to you for the refreshing that we need and for the relationship that we need with our Lord and our Savior, with our Messiah, Jesus. We ask this together now, in the mighty name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.